بسم الله I'm just wondering the uh, someone who hasn't come to this masjid for um, last month or so but he's getting the emails must think that every week we're talking about loving Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and in one sense that's fantastic alhamdulillah but actually uh, as uh, most of you know the title the final part of uh, the rights that we owe to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his haq or his rights upon us sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, the last part has for one reason or the other been delayed um, we were supposed to do it last week but um, I think we kind of distracted into some fiqhi issues so today inshallah I hope to conclude the last part so with that being said I'll say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Inna alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina أو فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وأما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We began about a month ago looking at the second part of the كلمة the كلمة لا إله إلا الله Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that there is none worthy of worship except Allah there is no true God but him and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him is Allah's slave and messenger Allah's final prophet that is to say this kalima is doctrine and practice it's the doctrine or belief that Allah is one with no partner whatsoever Allah is one, unique, having neither equal, no partner, no parents, no children. Allah, one, being unique, possessing all of the qualities of perfection, possessing all of the attributes of divinity, <coughs> majesty, greatness, benevolence, kindness, Mercy, compassion, might, strength, justice. And la ilaha illallah, that none has the right to be worshipped except him. No one and nothing is allowed to be taken as a god or a deity or a divinity that is worshipped. Illallah, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first half of the kalima. And that is the main reason why Allah sent prophets and messengers throughout human history. The Quran says, وَلَقَدْ بَأَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ To every nation, we sent prophets and messengers teaching, worship Allah alone, and shun or turn away from all that is worshipped besides Allah. The various prophets came to their people as we learn in Surah Al-A'raf, the seventh chapter of the Qur'an. And they came to their people and they said, Ya qawm i'budullaha, ma lakum min ilahin ghayru. O my people, worship Allah, you have none other than Him who you should be taken as a deity to be worshipped, as a divinity to be worshipped. And this message was the message of all of the prophets and the messengers alayhim salatu wassalam starting from the very first prophet Adam alayhi salam and going through until the very last prophet, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam We are taught in a hadith in the Sunan of Tirmidhi Inshallah the majority of scholars consider this hadith to be authentic <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the people of this earth 124,000 prophets and messengers 124,000 anbiya and rusul and it is said in that same hadith that out of the 124,000 313 or 315 were messengers rusuls or rusul and the rest were anbiya prophets that kind of also gives us an indication 
that according to some calendars, such as the traditional Jewish calendar, that believes that the age of the earth is about five, four and a half or five, five thousand years old, just the fact that Allah sent 124,000 prophets and messengers throughout mankind's history probably gives us uh, an indication that the earth is the earth and mankind is much older than four or five thousand years. If you were just to say that Allah sent one prophet every year, okay, and we know some prophets like Musa, uh, like uh, Noah alayhi salam, was with his people for 950 years, okay. But even if we averaged it out to one prophet a year, still you're talking about 124,000 years. And even if we say, well, two prophets to two different areas of the earth, then you're still talking about 70 odd or 60 odd thousand years, okay. Uh, that's not, I'm not saying that that's the way we date the earth or mankind's stay on it. I'm just saying that it's likely that the earth and its people are more than uh, four and a half thousand, five thousand years old. And of course, uh, geology and plate tectonics and carbon dating and uh, cosmology and astrophysics puts the age of the earth, the planet earth, at about uh, four, about 4.5 billion years old. Uh, and when we say billion in English, uh, British, we mean uh, one billion is a thousand million, as opposed to an American billion, which is a million million. Okay, 4.5, so 4.5 thousand million years old is roughly the age of this earth. And they say that the whole universe, the cosmos, is about 15 billion years, or 13 and a half billion years old. 13 and a half thousand million years old. And its size, they say it's about 15 billion light years across. How wide is the universe? They say it's 15 billion light years. Okay, and just to give you an idea of the greatness of Allah's creation of the cosmos, a light year is the distance that light or a beam of light will travel in one year. A light year is the distance that a beam of light will cover in one year. In one second, does anyone know how far, how many miles light can travel in one second? Yeah, uh, roughly 186,000 miles in one second. That means a beam of light in one second could go around the circumference of this earth about seven times. Okay, so goodbye to Ryanair and and Qatar airs and whatever else have you, okay? And so if you take 186,000 miles in one second is what light travels, and then you times that by 60, you get the distance for how, long light, how far light travels in a minute. Times that by 60 again, how far it travels in an hour. Times that by 24, how far it's traveled in a day. Times that by 365, how far it's traveled in a year. <coughs> Times that by 15,000 million is really how many miles the universe is. SubhanAllah, Allah Akbar. Modern science actually can be a very powerful reason to strengthen Iman faith, not, not necessarily erode it. Okay? And I suggest that we shouldn't be shy of modern science. We shouldn't also think that the Qur'an is a scientific manual, but it would not be, it would not be uh, unsurprising if there were few scientific facts in the Qur'an, given the fact that science, along with rationality, logic, tends to be a universal language throughout histories of men. And I encourage the young brothers and sisters, if there are any young sisters, to, if you're at college, at uni, at school, Study hard, and if you're in the sciences, study it well, because it is a way of arriving at yaqeen, certainty and confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being uh, the creator. And even though atheists and atheism uh, in the form of uh, Dawkins and, and the recently deceased Hitchens and who have you, have used modern science to try to disprove the notion of the existence of Allah, actually modern science can be used so much to actually support it. So, la ilaha illallah, 
That's the doctrine, the creed. <coughs> Muhammad Rasulullah and Muhammad is his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is the way to live out the first part of the kalima, la ilaha illallah. To live out, to make la, uh, la ilaha illallah practical, to make it uh, manifested in, on the earth, that is the point of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That is to say, we cannot worship Allah as he wants us to, except by following Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah chose in his wisdom these men throughout time, earthly men, human men, but who had the best of hearts, the cleanest and purest of souls, <coughs> and he gave them wahi, revelation. And before they didn't know, and then they knew <coughs> because of wahi. And then they were sent to guide people out of the darkness of disbelief into the clear light of faith, iman, of yaqeen, of certainty, of tawheed, the oneness of God. And they were the best of people of their times. There was no saint or pious man who was higher in station than the prophet of his time. There is no maqam or station of human beings higher than the maqam of the anbiya and the rusul, the prophets and the messengers, alayhim as salatu was salam. And Allah in his wisdom chose the final prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to be the carrier and the transmitter and the teacher of his final revelation, Al-Qur'an. After which there will be no more prophets and there will be no more new revelation. All there will be is awliya and ulama and mujaddidun. There will be scholars and saints who will revive the religion and the religious teachings. There will no longer be any more prophets. And we learned a, 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 a month ago, we reminded ourselves that there's some basic rights that Allah has instated in the Qur'an and also in the hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ that we owe to the Prophet ﷺ. The first one is iman bihi, to have faith in him as a prophet, not as a historical figure of 7th century Arabia, <coughs> not as a historical figure, no, but as someone who was sent by Allah. When we say we have Iman in the, uh, in, in the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it means that we believe and we are certain Allah sent him as a Prophet to mankind. Not just to the Arabs, to mankind until the Day of Judgment. He is the Prophet until the Day of Judgment. That's what it means to have Iman in him and whatever else he came with. That's the first right that he has upon us. And we shouldn't doubt it. We shouldn't believe, because the word prophets, for example, in the English usage now, for example, when I was growing up as a young boy, uh, some of the Afro-Caribbean community were saying Bob Marley was the prophet of the, pe of the people. And because the word prophet in common language now just means someone who had, was visionary, not necessarily saw the future, but act, or not necessarily saw the future like a clairvoyant, Okay, but uh, 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 was a visionary in the sense that he could see that this is how mankind should be living. They say that Mahatma Gandhi was a prophet. Okay, some people, and the word, so the word prophet, it doesn't, it, uh, they use it in a way that the Bible doesn't use it, and they use it in a way that certainly we don't mean. We mean by a prophet, someone Allah chose and gave wahi revelation to and made him uh, a leader and a guide for, some, for a set of people and in the case of the Prophet for the whole of mankind another right that we owe him sallallahu alayhi wa is that we should obey him but here is the point that I made last time we shouldn't think that obedience to the Prophet is a chore I'm not saying obedience is not difficult Obedience to Allah and to his Prophet وسلم, is, can be difficult Not because the things that we're asked to do are necessarily so difficult 
or almost impossible, but because the soul doesn't like to obey anyone or anything other than its own dictates. The nafs doesn't like to submit to anything or anyone else. Prayer, that act of worship with a few bowings and prostrations, which really uh, takes about five or seven minutes of the day, I mean, leave it, I'm not talking about the sunnahs, just the obligation, will take five or seven minutes of the day, are not prayed by so many, not because the act is hard, it's harder to get from one end of the central line to the other end of the northern line, okay, you can make the journey from here to, to Paris easier than you can on the, uh, on the tube, okay, that's hard, that's difficult, and no doubt the, the difficulty will increase when the Olympics well and truly start. And then you try travelling in East London, it's subhanAllah. That will be the new nightmare. <laughs> Mashallah. Unless you own a shop somewhere nearby and then you're really maybe laughing. But the, it's re, the reason why the, the, uh, the, 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 the prayer or something is hard is because the soul is struggling to submit to that which in and of itself is fairly simple and easy. So Allah gives, Allah orders us obedience to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not as a chore, but because in obeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lies our best interest. Fi dunya wal akhirah. In terms of this world and in terms of the hereafter. And that's why the Quran will say, it, it will say, follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, come to that which gives you life. The Quran will talk about following Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as that which gives you life. The Sharia has been, the laws of Islam has been, have been instated for our own benefit and for the benefit of others. The laws of inheritance have been instated to make sure that justice is done in sharing out the, uh, the wealth of the deceased parent. The laws of, uh, of marriage have been instated to ensure that the husband and the wife know their unique duties and obligations and are also aware of their shared obligations. Prayer has been instated so that we don't become religious only when we feel like it. And when we don't feel like it, we're going days and days and months or even years without the remembrance of the Creator, which hearts are so desperately in need of. So Allah says, whether you're feeling good or you're feeling bad, whether you're feeling really saintly or you're not feeling saintly, you're going to have to remember God at these five times within, throughout the 24-hour cycle. But it is hope that slowly and steadily, you'll overcome your sluggishness and your laziness and from being a chore, it will begin to turn into a delight. And so at some mature time in your life, and it could happen even sooner for some people, that prayer becomes from a chore to uh, I want to do it, from I want to do it, I need to do it, from I need to do it, that I am restless without being in communication and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's where we're trying to head to. And so following the, obeying the Prophet ﷺ isn't a chore. It's not like Allah trying to catch you off guard. I'm gonna, you, the Prophet ﷺ says, this is a command that's going to catch you. No, it's there for our own good. In either our own good, for example, the Prophet ﷺ says, when you go to the bathroom, you know, when you answer the call of nature, um, make sure that you clean yourself enough that there are no urinal drips. You no urinal drips on your, uh, you know, uh, from your private part, so that it doesn't begin to stain your clothes. Why? Because this is not a good thing. It's an unhygienic thing. It doesn't befit the dignity of man. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِ Adam. The same, the, the Prophet ﷺ would tell us that, uh, that make sure that you remove the excessive hair in your private regions. Why? Because uh, the hotness and the dampness that can happen, it can cause all sorts of diseases and problems. So the Prophet ﷺ says within 40 days, make sure you clip your nails, make sure you trim your moustache, make sure you uh, remove the, uh, the hair from your armpits and your private regions for personal hygiene. And then there are business rules so that you don't cheat me and I don't cheat you. And the rich don't continue to get richer and the poor are more and more exploited. So all of the rules of the Sharia are there as a benefit for me 
and a benefit so that I don't harm myself and I don't harm others and others, their harms are kept away from me. That's what the Sharia is at. And we need to therefore really take the uh, obedience to the Prophet seriously. Otherwise, whoever obeys me, the Prophet says, all of my followers will enter paradise except those who refuse. Who will refuse Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The Prophet said, whoever, ob whoever obeys me will enter paradise. Whoever, refused, wh whoever does not obey me or disobeys me <coughs> has refused. So we need to make sure we are not from those foolish people who refuse to enter Jannah or paradise. By how? By making sure we obey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just when we're in the masjid, but also when we're outside of the masjid, there are duties and acts of obedience. Ittiba, the th another, uh, another right, ittiba, to imitate the Prophet ﷺ. There are duties and obligations that we have to obey the Prophet ﷺ with. But then there are higher functions. There are higher functions. And those higher functions, we normally refer to them as the sunnas, the sunan. And the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ, they draw us closer to Allah. They actually draw us closer to Allah. They are a proof of our love of Allah and our love of the Prophet ﷺ. If we are practicing them, uh, not as a, a list of instructions, but if we're understanding that they have the human spiritual greatness that they, that they have and that, that are embedded in them. Okay? Because sometimes we can follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's sunnahs and we can still look very rough and coarse and harsh and rude. That's because we may be either practicing them all wrong or taking them as kind of rules disassociated from nobility and saintliness and godliness. But when we understand that the sunnahs are there to beautify the human character in front of Allah and to beautify the human behavior in front of others and to purify the heart from its wicked diseases and stains, then subhanAllah, ittiba of the Prophet becomes more important to me. How do I become a noble person? Not by speaking the Queen's English, that's not nobility. How many a person can speak the Queen's English, but they're wretched creatures? And how many people can't speak the Queen's <coughs> English, but they are noble in the sight of Allah? Inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum. The noblest of you in the sight of God are those who are most godly, the most have most fear of God, most taqwa, most piety. Another of his rights is that we send salawat upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we hear his name mentioned. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we said the two rights that we would leave for today, the right that he be loved, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the right that he be honored and venerated. The first obligation, the first right, is represented by the word mahabba, love. And this word, mahabba, love, we need to bring back into the vocabulary of the Muslims. Uh, it used to be uh, very central to the vocabulary of the Muslims. But in recent times, however recent, uh, uh, mahabba has been kind of sidelined. So the Muslim, we don't like to talk about mahabba now. We would like to talk about obedience, fear, but actually mahabba, love, is at the center of the kalama, la ilaha illallah. See, you have love, you have fear, you have hope, you have other qualities. You fear Allah, okay, because, but fear is not the goal. You hope in Allah's mercy and forgiveness, and that's what we should be doing, but hope is not the goal. Love is the goal. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهَ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Wallahu ghafoor rahim. Say, if you do love Allah, this is what the Quran says, if you do love Allah, <laughs> follow me. Follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imitate me. Imitate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah will, love, uh, Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. Allah will love you. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine? Allah will love you. The Arab poet says, Laysa sha'an an tuhib. 
إنما الشعن أن تحب. The affair is not that you love, but that you be loved. The affair is not that you should love, of course we should love, but more than loving, we want to be loved. And the Prophet said that Allah said, My servant doesn't draw closer to me with anything more loved by me than the obligatory duties, the fara'id that I have enjoined on him. And then my servant continues to draw closer to me through the nawafil, the optional deeds, until I love him. And today we Muslims, uh, many Muslims there, uh, swimming in the sea of confusion. Who should I love? And whose love do I seek? But the believer is clear in this. We must be clear that we seek to, we lo- we seek to love Allah and we seek Allah's love for us. And everything else follows after that. And love is hard work. Love is hard work. At some stage, the hard work doesn't seem hard work. It seems easy. But in the beginning, love can be hard work. Before you cross, one crosses that line between love as hard work to love as pure joy and bliss. It is hard work. And love that we have for a beloved will always entail sacrifice. The one who loves, the woman who loves to walk down the catwalk as a model, okay, she is not eating except like three or four crumbs of food a day, starving herself just so that she can reach that figure. And if she doesn't reach it, she's begging the editor of the magazine to airbrush her her picture on the magazine so she has the right figure. Otherwise, it's pure abstention, okay? And many of them can't hack it very long, and they get into a a life of drugs and things that can sustain, uh, be a replacement for eating, and it's a real dull life. But they do it because they they have a love, and they're ready to, at least they think they're ready to sacrifice. The footballer does the same thing. Okay, many of you remember, if you, if you like football, then when, when, the, uh, when uh, Gascoigne, Gaza, kind of overate in just before one of the matches, and you know, that was because footballers shouldn't be doing that, because you can't run after them, you can't do anything, you can't last for 90 minutes, let alone. Okay, so there is sacrifice. The gymnast has to sacrifice. The person who wants to reach an academic high in, in an academic career has to sacrifice. The person who wants to start a business, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, Bill Gates, or if you were talking about Steve Jobs, or whoever you're talking about, okay, of the, of the people who made it in the world, they had to sacrifice what they, for what they loved. We see that in the story of the prophets and the messengers, they sacrificed. So love and faith just naturally bring about a struggle and the need to sacrifice. So if someone says, I'm finding Islam difficult, that's the nature of faith. Because it requires a struggle and sacrifice. Love is not cheap. Love is not cheap. Okay. So loving the Prophet And so the first word is mahabba. Loving the Prophet And the second word is ta'zim. Veneration. Honor. Respect. Everyone who has, everyone who does ta'zim does love, but not everyone who does love does ta'zim. An example. Parents love their children, but they don't honour them. But children should love and honour their parents as a duty. Everyone who honours automatically loves, because honour, ta'zim, incorporates love. But not everyone loves honours. Because, for example, a person can, for example, a person can say, I love um, this, I love my scholar, for example. Okay? And when they see the scholar come in, uh, perhaps they don't, um, standing up is fine uh, for scholars, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, or they see him carrying something heavy and they kind of, they just sit there. But they love him. 
true, but they don't respect him and venerate him as is his right. Because respect and veneration would be that, how can I honour this man? I can honour him by relieving him of his burden, as an, as an example. And we'll see that in some of the narrations in Shamatana um, soon. So you have mahabba, love and ta'adheem. Let's just turn to some one, one or two um, things about love and ta'adheem, just to put us on a, a secure footing in terms of religious texts. <clears throat> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, or the Qur'an says, قُلْ And I've read this. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ ف- oh, No, sorry. قُلْ إِن كَانَ أَبَاءُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاءُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَأَشِيرَتُكُمْ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْعَايَةِ أَحَبُّ عِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ فَتَرَبَّصُوا حَتَّى يَعْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَحْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ Allah says, Say, if it be that your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your family, the wealth that you, uh, that you hoard, or the business that you take delight in, uh, that delight in, or the houses that you uh, occupy yourselves, ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi, are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger, and jihad in His path, and striving in His way, then wait until Allah brings about His decision, for Allah doesn't guide a sinful people. And how can we tell? about when these things are more beloved to us than Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Well, love has alamat, has signs. Love has alamat, signs. When you see someone dressed in a particular way and they resemble a particular film star and they do that consciously, you know that's because there is some alaqa, some connection in the heart with that film star or personality. So they imitate. They imitate. Okay? The particular dress they will imitate, the particular way of talking they will imitate. Love has certain alamat. When you love something or someone, you, t- you quite often remember it. It's always part, it's on your tongue. And if it's not on your tongue, if you can get a picture, you'll hang a picture on the wall. And if not, then you'd like to just see something, keep it, you know, it's on my phone, it's on my smartphone, the pictures of those who I love. It used to be in the back pocket of your wallet. Okay, but now we've got the smartphones and you can have videos and everything. But that's natural. Love immediately forces remembrance. So, even if we take just two signs of love, and love is when, the, when, when, when Layla says to Majnoon or when, when, when Juliet says to Romeo, listen, just wait for me outside by the lamppost. And Romeo looks up and he thinks, you know, it's a, it's, it's a gale force nine blizzard. But Juliet says it fluttering her eyelids, gale force or no gale force. Mm-hmm. Romeo is outside there, standing there. And you know what? For his love of Juliet, a blizzard is nothing. It's a mere inconvenience. Because love, at some stage, melts away those hardships at some stage. So, what about our love of the Prophet How much do we remember him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How much are we ready to praise him through salawat, durood, salam, salat and salams upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as an example? Or do we only stir in remembering him when someone in the media or in, in the wider society uh, curses him or dishonors him, then I stir into motion. Then am I actually stirred into motion because of the greatness of his status or just the fact that he is part of the tribe that I belong to called Islam? Is it a tribal thing? Because sometimes it could be not stirred by the love of the Prophet, stirred by that you spoke against something that I am a part of. And you could have done that about my culture, the city I was born in, and you would have seen the same reaction then that's not defending and loving the Prophet ﷺ. Inshallah, when most Muslims do stir into action, inshallah, it's love of the Prophet ﷺ. But we need to still be careful what motivates us. Love of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, how much do I imitate him? Because love, imitation is part of love. 
in my inward character, in my outward character, in my character in public, in my character in private. And not only how much do I imitate him, something even more important. How much do I desire to imitate him, sallallahu alayhi wa Since he is khayru khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation. So it's not about the question of Abu Ali, what is the Islamic hukum? What is the Islamic ruling about a Muslim man going, growing a beard or not? Or a Muslim man uh, having his uh, lower garment above his ankle? Or a Muslim man using a tooth stick? Or a Muslim doing this? Or a Muslim doing that? Those are relevant questions, no doubt. But it's more so things are more likely to come when love is implanted in the heart. And then, subhanAllah, it's on a roll. Now, I am confident. As long as I'm reading the religious text right, as long as I'm contextualizing the religious texts, and as long as I'm certain that I'm following sound <laughs> scholarly knowledge, I'm not talking about those that minority, fringe minority that goes under, the, uh, uh, goes under scholarship, which sometimes has very wacky and weird opinions, but just, inshallah, it's mainstream normative scholarship. As long as I'm following that, then really, I don't look left or right. It doesn't really matter what people say about me or not say about me. Okay? But at the moment, our hearts are defeated, are, are enslaved, because actually... Too many of us are, and, you know, and I can't exclude myself from this, too many of us are too concerned with what other people are saying, will say about us. Just let's be clear that what is Allah saying about us, and what is my relationship to his beloved Prophet, وسلم, his Habibullah, and then thinking about others is a secondary thing. Okay? لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه إليه من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the hadith of Anas, recorded in Bukhari, none of you truly has faith. None of you truly believes. It means none of you have perfect faith until I become more beloved to him than his parents, his children, and the whole of mankind. Subhanallah. And what we wouldn't sacrifice for our children. That's mo most parents were like that. They, what they wouldn't sacrifice and what they don't sacrifice for their children. But what we should sacrifice for the Prophet's last in that sense is it should be even greater because love of him should trump love of anything else. Love. We need to bring that back in. So that the rules of Islam don't just become some formal rules. They are endowed with meaning. Ah, oh, that's why the sheikh is going on about the beard a bit. Because the beard goes back to the sunnah of all of the prophets and the messengers. Alayhim was salatu was salam. And the imitation of the, uh, of the prophets is the thing that Allah is most pleased with. It draws a person closer to Allah. It elevates him in rank. It causes him to be part of the natural way of living. That thing called the fitra. It saves him from being hostage to the fashions of the time. And you know what? I think nearly... I'm not quite sure if this happened in my parents' country. Okay, But actually, anyone who lives in the West, as you grow up, when you're young, you're 10, 11, 12, 13... <coughs> When you're, and then maybe you're 16, 18, 20, and then when you're 25, you go through these fashion cycles, okay? And it normally begins to settle around about, I don't know, about 25, 30, would you say? And then you kind of begin, however you was at 25 or 30, that's probably how you'll continue to be, you know, uh, in, in terms of, you know, your outlook and your fashion and whatever, generally. But when you look back, when people look back at their fashion uh, statements, it becomes a real laugh, and sometimes it becomes a ridicule. So I grew up in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the reckless eighties, okay, uh, the eighties where people were. Uh, does anyone remember hairspray? Yeah. Right, okay. You could get through a can of hairspray, like one of these big cans, right, in about two or three days, like that. It doesn't matter if a plane flew by over your head; your hair would not move. It would be set in stone. They could have painted to put hairspray on bricks. And leave the, leave the, what do you call it? What's the thing that comes in between the bricks? What's the word? The, the, the mortar, okay? They could have used hairspray and the bricks would have been stuck together. Okay? 
But then you look back at it and you think, oh, that's such cringiness. We're saved from all of that palaver by just following the natural way of mankind that Allah instated and loves which is the sunnah of his prophets and messengers, and specifically the sunnah of his prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's love. Love is, you know, I, need, I want to be as much closer to my beloved. And when you're told that your beloved is the master of mankind, the most God-fearing of creation, the most knowledgeable of them, the, mo the wisest of them, the kindest of them, then the desire to imitate excels untold. So it's a matter of who will I give the key to my heart to? Someone who will abuse my heart, my heart's loves and desires, and make money out of me in a consumerist cycle? <coughs> Someone who will press a few buttons in my heart to get my political attention later on only to be treacherous towards me when the going gets a bit rough and his, his or her political career needs to take another turn. Or the one who says, I don't wish anything for you except good because I'm sent by God to you and I'm to you a true advisor. And I wept in prayer at night for you. And I asked Allah to forgive you. And I lost those who I loved in war for you. So that the message could be given to you that you would know God as I know God. That you would know Allah and worship Allah as I worship Allah. And that you will come with me in Allah's everlasting Jannah and garden. And that's why in the authentic hadith, there occurs these words. The Prophet said, My life is good for you, and my death is good for you. My life is good in that news comes to me, and I tell you. News meaning? Revelation comes to me, and I tell you. And my death is good for you in that your deeds are shown to me, and if they are good, I thank Allah. For it, and if they are bad, I ask Allah's forgiveness for you for it. The Muhammadan concern for us is still going on even now. He is asking Allah forgiveness for our deeds even as we speak because He is still concerned for us. How? We don't know. It's another realm. It's another realm. But it is something we know to be true because he starts and told us in the sound hadith. How could we not love him? Even just by knowing those few things. But the more we read about his life, how just he was, how compassionate he was, how caring he was, how generous he was, how beautiful he was, how noble he was. How awesome he was. The more we read of his seer, his life, the heart just begins to melt. But we have closed the books of seer and we opened the TV, or it's like, and we drowned our hearts <coughs> in knowledge of others, which will have no benefit, which probably has very little benefit for us here. And it will have no benefit for us in the hereafter. Okay. SubhanAllah. So, none of you truly believes until I become more beloved to him. So it's a matter of making the Prophet more beloved to us than our parents, our children and the whole of mankind. So it's not that we don't make our parents and children and mankind beloved to us. We do. We just try to make Allah's messengers of Allah and Allah Himself more beloved to us. Let me quickly go on uh, about ta'zim. Let me talk about because there are most of what I've said now. Even if you didn't know this hadith or that verse, you, I don't think there is anyone who didn't know the the general outline that we 
are, we should be loving the Prophet But there is some, uh, something that the Qur'an says that many Muslims have forgotten. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are a few verses, there are other verses. Allah says, لِتُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُعَزِّرُوهُ وَتُوَقِّرُوهُ So that you, O mankind, may believe in Allah and His Messenger. وَتُعَزِّرُوهُ وَتُوَقِّرُوهُ And that you may honor Him and help Him. تُعَزِّرُوهُ So you have uh, uh, and, uh, to, to, to help Him. And تُوَقِّرُوهُ تَوْقِير is like تَبْجِيل is like تَعْذِيم These are all Arabic and actually some of them are Quranic words which means uh, honor, respect, veneration. Honor, respect, veneration. So the Quran is saying that you believe in Allah and the Prophet ﷺ and that you help him and that you venerate him. Venerate and honor him, which is higher than love. And the, the Quran also gives us some indications. So also the Quran will say, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la la tuqaddimu bayna yadayhi Allahi wa rasuli وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Oh, you who believe. لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Do not put yourself forward before Allah and His Prophet, but fear Allah. Indeed, Allah hears and sees all things. Do not put yourself forward before Allah and His Messenger. How do we put ourselves forward? One of the clear ways is Allah and His Prophet have said something and I put my opinion before theirs. Allah has forbidden this. Before we know what Allah and His Messenger said, we might say something. Once we clearly know that they have said something clearly, we are not people who put our opinions before Allah and His Messenger. We are neither, uh, we are neither as knowledgeable or as wise as Allah, of course not. But we're not even as knowledgeable or as wise as the Prophet wasallam. And also, we have a nafs. Many of us who talk, we have an ego. The Prophet didn't have an ego. Okay? He didn't have, it, mashallah, Allah, he overcame his ego. It was all sincere to Allah, something that very few people could ever claim. And I, I, would, I could never claim that. I would like to claim that, but it's certainly not the case now. Also, Allah says, لا تجعلوا دعاء do not make the calling of the Prophet as you call one another. So I can say, Ya Abdurrahman, Ya Akh Salam, O oh, Abdurrahman, O oh, oh, Brother Salam. But I can't say, Ya Muhammad. Allah forbade the Muslims at that time from saying, Ya Muhammad. Say, Ya Nabi. Ya Rasul. Because the Semitic way, and it's actually embedded now in the Urdu and the Asian sub and the Asian culture, which is very probably comes from the Semitic culture of the Middle East. The 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 Jewish Muslim culture and the Mediterranean Christian culture, which is when you really respect someone, you don't use their name. When I was growing up when I was about uh, seven or eight years old, I thought my father's name, his name is Rahmatullah, but actually they call him Anwar for short. I thought my father's name was uh, Sunoji. I thought his name was Sunoji Sharif. Because my mother would say, Sunoji, you know, listen here. And I, I just used to hear it, Sunoji. So I thought, and it's only one day when I saw some document and it said Rahmatullah Sharif and I had a picture of my father, I thought, oh. He's got another name. <laughs> but, you know, but because that culture is where you don't call the person who you respect by their name. That's why we don't call the Queen, oh, how are you doing, Elizabeth? You call her Her Majesty, the Queen, because it's an honorific title. In fact, it's quite interesting. It's not that you can't ever call them by their first name. It's not disrespect to, but it's more respectful not to do it. Okay? And the Arabs have that, the Quran has that. Okay, and it's interesting that throughout the Quran you'll find words like Ya Isa, such and such and such, Ya Ibrahim, such and such and such, Ya Musa, such and such and such, Ya Dawood, Ya Yaqub, Ya Nu. Okay, Allah has said, Oh, prophets, you know, all these prophets by name, and He's spoken to them with love. 
But nowhere in the Quran is they said, Ya Muhammad. It's just Ya Nabi. There is an indication in how Allah is talking to the Prophet وسلم, of respecting him. Don't you see that Allah says, and he didn't have to say, Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Subhanallah. I just, I, 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 I've never been able to get over this. Indeed, Allah and his angels send durood upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, you who believe, send salat durood upon him and do so abundantly. Allah, why? Indication, not only of the connection between Allah and his most beloved and his habib, but also how we should be venerating him. It's not a matter of just following the sunnah. It's a matter about celebrating his life and vener venerating his existence, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let me just finish, okay, with a few statements from the ancient people. Because in the end, it's um, many, many things progress positively. By and large, technology progresses positively. I mean, you have nuclear weapons, which is a bit of a, bit of a kind of scourge on the, on the uh, progress of technology. But, you know... The Samsung 3 is coming out soon, as the billboards are telling us. That's, a, that's an improvement on so many other phones. And then they're going to have these TVs, you know, uh, and you can do that. And what's it called? Gesturing. That's the word, gesturing. You don't even have to get up for your armchair, so we can now become more fatter. But, you know, less. <laughs> Why don't you got the remote controls? But um, we believe, spiritually, generally, there is regression. Things tend to go downhill. As time goes on, Spiritually, faith-wise, morally, people tend to degenerate, even religious communities. So we actually believe that not technologically, not scientifically, but spiritually, <coughs> faith-wise and morally, ethically, the peak of mankind, the pinnacle, was in the time of the Prophet and the Sahaba. Okay, they may not have known trigonometry, they may not have known you know, modern day physics, they may not have known whatever, but they knew Allah, they feared him, they were sincere, they were lovingly obedient, they strove in his path, and they tried to spread goodness to mankind in the way they understood goodness. And so the Prophet said about them, خَيْرٌ nasi qarni, ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونُهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونُهُمْ The best of mankind is my generation than those who come after them, than those who come after them. And just in case you think the bestness means here, the, they smiled the best, they spoke the softest the best. No, they did that as well. But khayriya here, khayrun nas, khayriya, this excellence or bestness, first and foremost applies to their knowledge. How do we know that? The Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, May yuridi Allahu bihi khair. Same word khair. May yuridi Allahu bihi khair yufaqihu fi al-deen. When, al when Allah intends to show khair to someone, He gives him the understanding of the religion. So if I want to know, is Allah doing khair, good to me? I just have to look at how is my religious understanding. Not am I a scholar. How is my religious understanding? If I'm someone who is, you know, like as I am now, uh, you know, somewhere in the 40s or whatever, and I don't know my basic religious obligations, that is an, and I had the time to learn it, not like I'm a convert or something like that, or lived in, you know, the jungle, <coughs> and I had the time to learn it, but I didn't, then that is a proof that right now in my life, Allah is not showing me khair. I may be surrounded by wealth and material advancement, but Allah is not showing me khair. Alhamdulillah, Allah is ready to, change that in the very second so there's no despair don't despair but it just shows right now no so the sahaba had the best understanding let alone the best practice so let's look at and those who follow them those following so i'd like to very quickly um look at a few things about some stories yeah some some narrate narratives uh one of the nice source books of knowing the, light, uh, the actions of the Sahaba towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in terms of their love and their esteem and is a book by Qadi Ayyad, Ash-Shifa, uh, The Healing, which is a, 
an Arabic book, but it has an, an English translation. Um, and it's worth getting by Qadi Iyad, rahmatullahi And there's a chapter, The Companions' Reverence, Esteem, and Veneration for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's gone through the chapter of The Companions' Love, and how we should, now he's talking about The Companions' Reverence and Esteem. Okay, so let's just read a few narrations from some of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu majma'in. Uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, Abdullah uh, Amr ibn al-As relates, radiallahu anhu, there was none more beloved to me than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa nor anyone more honorable in my sight than him. I could never get my fill at looking at him due to my reverent awe of him. If I was asked to describe him, I couldn't do so. For I was unable to gaze at him long enough. SubhanAllah. That is reverence. There is a type of jalali, the jalaliness the Prophet Sassan had. This majestic awe. Where something you just couldn't you just couldn't look up for long enough. And see, this Sahabi says, if you ask me to describe him, I mean of course you could describe him in some, but it's just showing that you know he wasn't able to gaze long enough. But actually, compare the next narration. Tirmidhi says that Anas radiallahu said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu would go out to his Sahaba, his companions, from amongst the Muhajirun and the Ansar. And they would be sitting. And in their midst would be Abu Bakr and Umar. No one would raise their gaze towards the Prophet sallallahu except Abu Bakr and Umar. They would look at him and he would look at them. They would smile at him and he would smile back at them. And the rest of them were like uh, Amr ibn al-As, just couldn't raise their head. Because the veil between those lovers was lifted. Really, the veil between those lovers, Abu Bakr and Umar, vis-a-vis the Prophet and vice versa, it was kind of lifted. Okay. But that's reverence. Osama ibn Sh- uh, Shariq said, I once came to the Prophet and found his companions sitting around him absolutely still as if birds were perched on top of their heads because fidgeting in the front of honorable people is not the done thing and whispering and checking our mobile phones and looking at the time and excess fidg- no it shows that the heart is not paying attention unlikely the ears are paying attention as well that's one of the things i find that the elders still have over the uh, the youngsters by miles yeah, that our elders okay, can still sit in a talk of an alim for about an hour and 15 minutes or two hours without fidgeting, still smiling, saying, SubhanAllah, Akbar. And the attention span of the second generation of Muslims, if it goes above 35 minutes, we're kind of, we're restless. We got, you know, they say, they say as I was growing up, ants in your pants. Okay? Uh, and that's really incredibly a shame. But uh, I would then say that the elders need to thank Allah that he's given them a potential that they could climb heights if only that they understood what gift they are given. Okay? Wallah. Another hadith, let me quickly go through. This is in Sayyid Bukhari as well. When the Quraysh deployed Urwa bin Mas'ud, this is not the Sahabi, this is Urwa ibn Mas'ud, who was one of the chieftains of the Quraysh. And they're trying to reason with the Prophet ﷺ that, look, you know, do you have to spread this religion and cause all these problems and this and the other? and is there some compromise we can get to? So they think, oh, you know what? Always really good, and he's really eloquent as well. And the Prophet has got this eloquent thing, that poetry that he's coming out with. So we'll send one of our eloquent ones to him. So Urwa, that's what's his, his name. Urwa ibn Mas'ud, uh, they deployed him to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in the year of Hudaybiyah. And then he saw what he saw of unparalleled reverence that the companions accorded to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what Urwa says. That whenever he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed wudu, they would race to get the leftover waters of his wudu water. Almost fighting for it. If he spat, they took it in their hands and they wiped over their faces and their bodies. If a hair of his fell, they ran to get it. If he ordered them with something, they hastened to carry it out. When he spoke, they would lower their voices in his presence and none of them could look at him out of awe, with him, awe of him. And so when Urwa returns back to the Quraysh and they say, so, you know, what, you know, what happened in your dialogue? He said, O oh, assembly of Quraysh, I have been to Khosrow, 
the ruler of Persia and his kingdom. I've been to Caesar and his kingdom. And I've been to Negus in Abyssinia and his kingdom. But by Allah, never have I seen a king among his people treated anything like how Muhammad is treated by his companions. And that thing about hair, nails, uh, spit, uh, and, uh, and wither water, it's because it is part of the aqidah of, of, uh, of uh, Sunni Islam, of Ahl Sunnah al-Jama'ah. That anything and everything that the Prophet ﷺ touches or is part of the Prophet ﷺ, it's barakah. It's barakah, blessed. His spit was blessed. <coughs> His nails were blessed. His Salaam's hair was blessed. His whole body وسلم, was blessed. When he Salaam touched, the place that he touched was blessed. And there is no doubt about this. This is not a difference of opinion or some scholars say, no, it's an agreement. It's an agreement. And therefore, just like we do with Zamzam, which is Barakah as well, just like if we had a chance, we would wash ourselves with Zamzam, we would drink Zamzam, hopefully make a good dua whilst we're drinking Zamzam. We might even wash our clothes in it if we could bring enough back. Okay? Then the Prophet Salaam's physical being, as well as the nur inside of him, but his physical being was, is like Zamzam, but more so. And that's why they ran to get his hair and keep it. They would collect his water and wash over. They would get his spit. And he wasn't a spitter normally. Okay, because that's kind of generally bad. Sort of adab. And he didn't have bad manners. Okay, but in the times when he did, they would catch it. Uh, in Sahil Bukhari, the lady, Aish, uh, the lady Asma, عنها, Aisha's younger sister, عنها, she had a, a jubba, a cloak of the Prophet. ﷺ. I think uh, after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, the lady Aisha had it, and the lady Aisha then gives it to her sister, Asma. And what would happen is, you're living at the time of the, of, of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, and you've got like, let's just say you have a, you have a fever. So what you do is, I as your son, you say, uh, Abu Alia, go to Asma's house. And you give me a bucket with maybe some water in it. And then I'd go to Asma radiallahu anha and I'd say, uh, Oh, mother of the believers, uh, not over the mothers, oh, you know, uh, Asma radiallahu anha, uh, my father's got fever, so, you know, here's the water. And what she'd do is she'd take out the jubba, the, 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 uh, the tunic of the Prophet, and she'd dip it in and she'd rinse it. So now the water has touched the blessed clothes of the Prophet. So now that water, now it's rinsed, it's blessed. And you'd go and you'd wash yourself with it or you'd drink it any way that you'd think it was a cure. Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Salama radiallahu anha, one of the wives of the Prophet she had, uh, Bukhari says she has three hair strands of the Prophet Same thing, you had a cold, you'd go with a little cup to Umm Salama's house radiallahu anha, she'd bring out the hair of the Prophet she'd dip it in there, or she'd put more water over the hair to go into your bucket, and then you drink it, or you bathe in it, or you do something sensible with it because of barakah. When Allah gifted us the Prophet Subhanallah, Subhanallah, He didn't hold back. He didn't hold back. And this basic knowledge, which is in our mother books, is knowledge that is forgotten. But if it was remembered, even if we couldn't get to His hair or to his sandals, or to his nails, or to his cloak, even if we couldn't, just the thought of what it can do, and what Allah has placed in it, is enough to cause the heart to venerate and love. So I say these, not necessarily to go out and seek it, but I will say, whoever can seek it, let him seek it. And don't be fooled by the saying of uh, silly people, when they say, ah, oh, we don't have any of the hairs and the nails of the Prophet anymore. Wallahi, I have a tasbi, you know, a zikr bead of my grandfather who passed away 20, 30 years ago. Inshallah, he's a pious man, uh, inshallah. Uh, and, but he's my grandfather and he had one son and my father has one son. <laughs> and I have one son. <laughs> so there's sentimental value. That's a tasbi bead of a man who's not a prophet. And we all probably... Or most of us have family heirlooms. Do you think that the Sahaba were so ignorant that they thought, well, I have hairs and whatever, but we just throw it away? No. No. They knew what they were keeping. Yes, and in, uh, Turkey, 
Yeah, yeah they have absolutely in the in the absolute, and you can see it. You can't see it, touch it, but you can see it. And there are scattered throughout the world, and many of the sure, descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu and some of the Sayyids of Yemen, some of the Sayyids of India, some of the Sayyids of West Africa, some of the Sayyids of the Middle East, they also have these possessions. Uh, the school that I follow, Imam Ahmed bin Humble, he was very hot on doing this. Uh, he would uh, find out the traces of the Athar, they're called relics of the Prophet So, and he would go and he would benefit from them. Anyway, point being is, uh, that was Urwa bin Mas'ud, talking about the Sahaba. Let me read one or two more. Um, In the hadith of Mughira, I'm skipping a lot, okay. In the hadith of Mughira, it says, the Prophet's companions would knock on his door with their fingernails. Because out of reverence and respect for him. And Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, when that verse came down, do not raise, in Surah Hujrat, it's just before the verse that we read, do not raise your voice above the voice of the Prophet and do not put yourself forward above Allah and his messenger. Umar radiallahu anhu, who... You kind of can imagine his physical description and be sure that he had a sturdy voice, let alone a sturdy body and physique. When this verse was point, uh, came down in Surah Hujrat, do not raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet and Umar ibn al-Khattab would then talk to the Prophet and would say, Ya Rasulullah, can I do anything for you? Love bait. Ya Rasulullah, at your service. And he would say, Ya ibn al-Khattab, Ya ibn al-Khattab, I can't hear you speak loud because of what he understood of immense reverence that you should have. And he feared that he had a loud voice in the presence of the Prophet And this is the same Ibn al-Khattab, when he was caliph, and he entered the masjid of the Prophet and he saw two people, and they were by the grave of the Prophet and they were raising their voices, speaking loudly. They weren't shouting, they weren't being rude, they were just raising their voices of the Prophet And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Oh, you people, where are you from? And they said, we're from outside of Medina. He said, Wallahi, if you said you were from Medina, I would have whipped you, whipped you. Because do you not know that Allah said, do not raise your voices above the, vo above the Prophet Sallallahu And there is no one in that grave except Allah's Habib. SubhanAllah. Now you, it's, I, I, I don't disagree that at the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu now, there are things that shouldn't be practiced, but they, those things that shouldn't be practiced, like some people trying to make sajda at his grave, sallam, it's not done out of evil. They don't say, oh, let me make sajda at the grave of the Prophet because I want to disrespect him. It's just that they become so overwhelmed in love, either they forget what they're supposed to do, or sometimes they are ignorant and they don't know what to do. But we never, ever... We never ever cuss or curse a lover of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But love must be expressed in the right way. And the right way is according to the Sharia. And the Sharia does not permit anyone to make sajda to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By Allah, if a human being were, to, were ordered to make sajda in front of another human being, then the wife would have to be make sajda to the husband. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. If, but it's not a case now. So the lover needs to be taught. And the lover needs to be reminded. But it is love. And if someone says, oh, but isn't that being a bit soft on sin? No, it's not. It's being venerable, venerable to the, those who are venerating the Prophet but they're doing it wrong. And what's the proof of that? The scholars have said, look in Sahil Bukhari. There is a man at the time of the Prophet and he got caught drinking wine. And so the Prophet got him um, flogged, 80 lashes. And he got caught drinking a second time. So the Prophet got him flogged again. And then he got caught drinking a third time. And as they were going to flog him, someone in the audience said, May Allah curse him. Now why did they say that? Because you know, Allah, the Prophet has said in the authentic hadith, May Allah curse the drinker of wine, the seller of wine, the giver of wine, the one who witnesses the contract, the one who carries it, the one who delivers it. There's ten categories of curse. So this man says, May Allah curse him. It is his third time. And what did the Prophet say? No, don't say that, for he is a lover of Allah and his Prophet. Meaning, yes, he sinned, so we're not going to be soft on sin. We have to execute, we have to... Follow the Sharia and 
put the lashing on. <coughs> but he doesn't deserve to be cursed because I know him to be a lover. So when you see people doing things at the grave, which are, which are wrong, and mostly it will be the attempt to prostrate, kissing the grills and whatever, there's a scholarly dispute, but uh, wallah alim, um, I, could be, I could be wrong, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the school of Imam Ahmed, it's preferred not to kiss the gates. And it's allowed, but it's preferred not to kiss the gates. But anyway, the, uh, other schools may say different, I'm not aware of that. The point being is, if you see someone wrong, don't cuss them, don't curse them, gently remind them, because they're probably lovers, or at least in that state, they are lovers of the Messenger Salaam. And you, we don't want to be getting on the wrong side of the lovers. But at the same time, we have a duty to follow Allah Sharia. Simple way of squaring the circle. Simple way of squaring the circle. Because it's about love. And love is most precious. But love has to have guidelines. SubhanAllah. Let me just finish. And um, if someone wants, I can give them the, the whole of the the text here in Shalat Allah because it is worth a read or they can just get the book um, I'm going to mention to you an incident of Imam Malik and I'm going to mention six or seven scholars that he mentions they are all Tabi'un they're all second generation scholars of Medina they are all second generation they are, they are students of the Sahaba but they're all scholars the, the ones that I'm going to mention so don't worry about if you don't know the names the names aren't important it's how these scholars were okay with Imam Malik Okay, and then, we'll, and then we'll see where we go from there. So, Imam Malik said, Imam Malik said, Rahmatullahi, I was once asked what I said about Ayyub as sakhtiyani when I said, that I did not relate from anyone better than him, meaning I didn't relate hadith from anyone better than Ayyub as sakhtiyani So they questioned Imam Malik, why did you say that? You know, what caused you to say that? So Imam Malik said, I went on pilgrimage twice, and I never heard the Prophet ﷺ being mentioned without Ayyub as sakhtiyani weeping until we had pity on him. And when I saw from him what I saw of his reverence for the Prophet ﷺ, I then, to, I then started writing hadiths and transmitting hadiths from him. Mus'ab ibn Abdullah said, whenever the Prophet was mentioned, Imam Malik would grow pale, so much so that it disturbed those assembled around him. And, <clears throat> and he was once asked about it. Why, why, why does that happen to you? And he said, if you had seen what I have seen, you wouldn't object to what you see happens to me. I used to see Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir rahmatullah alayhi and he used to be the master of the Qur'an reciters and never was he asked about a hadith except that he wept to such an extent that we felt pity for him. And I used to see Ja'far, the son of Muhammad as-Sadiq who was jolly and smiled a lot but whenever the Prophet was mentioned in his presence he would turn pale. And I didn't see him citing a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ except in a state of wudu. I frequented him, I visited him for a time, and I never observed him except in one of three states. Either praying, ob observing silence, or reciting the Qur'an. He never spoke of affairs that didn't concern him, and he was a devout scholar who truly feared God. And whenever Abdurrahman ibn Qasim mentioned the Prophet His face seemed as if the blood had drained out of it and his tongue would be dumbstruck and mute out of awe and veneration of the Prophet And I used to visit Amir, the son of Abdullah ibn Zubair. Whenever the Prophet was mentioned in his presence, he would weep so much till he had no more tears to weep. And I saw Az-Zuhri, one of the friendliest and easygoing of the people. Yet whenever the Prophet ﷺ was mentioned in his presence, it was as if he didn't recognize you and you wouldn't recognize him. And I would visit Safwan ibn Sulaim, a deeply devout worshipper, whenever the Prophet ﷺ was mentioned in his presence. He wept so much that he couldn't stop himself. And at this point, people would have to get up and leave him. 
and these are major scholars of the Tabi'un of Medina. And then you wonder why Imam Malik was Imam Malik. Because when his eyes saw the likes of those people, and when he drank from the same mushrab of those people, so much so that when Malik radiallahu anhu would teach fiqh, he would just come into the masjid of the Prophet and teach, dress well I'm sure, but whenever he taught hadith of the Prophet he would go home, take a full bath, perfume himself with the best perfume, wear his cleanest clothes and come and sit and then teach hadith. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, the Imam of Ahlul Sunnah of his time, when you asked him a question about fiqh, Islamic law, if he was walking, he would tell you, this is halal, this is haram, this is better not to do, this should be avoided, this is an obligation. He will give you an answer. If you were walking with him and you asked him a question about a hadith, or you asked him a hadith, he would stop walking, he would sit down on the floor, legs crossed, and then he would say, Qala Rasulullah, he would narrate the hadith. Because of the veneration of the Prophet, not just love, ta'zeem on Nabi and this is what made uh, people like that great uh, the last thing is uh, I just want to end with this point um, our tradition is filled with examples like this I mean I'm not just picking out uh, the odd strange tale actually this is so normal this is normal stuff this is normal stuff, and you don't have to look very far. You'll find it in Sahih al-Bukhari, you'll find it in Sahih Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, you'll find it, in, let alone in the other books. But it wasn't just human beings who were like this towards the Prophet you and, you and I have probably heard of the hadith, the authentic hadith, in which he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is being shaded by a cloud. The cloud is moving. Uh, he Salasim, is moving and the cloud is just shading him from what? the heat of the sun you and I have probably heard about when he Salasim, he wanted to answer the call of nature normally it was his blessed habit to go very far from the people and also then to um, be sheltered behind something like a large rock or, and there wasn't anything and then he said to one of the Sahaba who were with him it could have been Anas Radiyana, I can't remember he said go and ask that tree that the, uh, Allah's messenger calls and then go and ask that tree and take it by the branch and, Allah, and the trees uprooted themselves and they came Okay, now we have an image of this because you can just watch Lord of the Rings and you can watch the Ents okay, as they uproot themselves and walk or whatever but these, they were walking right, okay, until they and he did what he had to do and when he had finished they just like that and they just went back to their places There was a, a garden in, in Medina, there was a number of gardens in Medina, about five or six kind of gardens. You know, not gardens like a back garden, but gardens like, a, like, a, like we'd call a public park, but probably, probably a bit smaller and less green. And there was a camel in it, and the people were getting a bit ruffled by this camel because it was being really stubborn and whatever. So the Prophet said, leave it. And it went in, and he saw went into the camel, and he stroked the camel. And he said, you know, why are you... Why are you causing uh, the people to panic? He said, because my master is ill-treating me and I don't like it. And he said to the camel, well, will you be a nice person? Will you be a nice camel if I go and talk to your owner? And he said, yes. And he goes and talks to his owner. He said, but don't, don't put too many things on his back. You're upsetting him. A camel knew that it could take its, it, 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 its heartaches to the Prophet Sallallahu and that he would do something about it because he was Rahmatullahi And then you know the famous thing on the, on the tree stump and those various narrations that let's, let's just read to the end, inshallah ta'ala. SubhanAllah. Let's read to the end. So a pulpit, a member, was made for the Prophet But before that, he used to address the people in Jum'ah, leaning on this stump, 
A stump is like a tree when it's cut down, then what's left of it, we call it a stump. So the stump of a date palm tree was what Hisasan was leaning on when he would give khutbahs. But then they thought, why don't they make him a mimbar, okay, a, a pulpit? And they did. And so the very first Jum'ah, when they made this pulpit a mimbar, Hisasan was on the mimbar, and the, the stump was over there. And when he started to give the khutbah, the whole of the masjid could hear the weeping and the sobbing of the stump of the date palm tree. And he Salasan, had to stop and he had to climb down. And in one narration of Bukhari, he knelt down and he hugged it. And they said, if he Salasan, didn't do that, and in one narration he Salasan, said, if I didn't do that, it would continue to cry until the day of judgment because of being parted from me. Because of being separated from me. Was the, was the sound very much high audible? Uh, you know, well, I, I have no idea how a date palm sobs or cries, but uh, the narrations in Bukhari say that the masjid heard it. So it's either all the masjid heard it or a good part of the masjid heard, heard it. But it was significant enough for the Prophet Sassim to suffer. Allah knows best. But more importantly than that, I mean, that is important. I want to end with what Imam Al Hassan Al Basri said about this. And Al Hassan Al Basri, Rahmatullah Alayhi, he said, O oh, servants of Allah, the stump of the date palm tree wept for the Messenger of Allah out of a yearning to be with him. You should have a greater yearning to want to meet him. And really, we just need to ask ourselves, um, am I going to be outdone in honor by a lifeless, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's lifeless, it's inanimate, a stump. Or am I going to rise up to my Adamic honor and the rule that Allah breathed into man that elevated him above the, to have the potential above angels and to connect with that Muhammadan reality, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to know how to be kareem and to have nobility connected to God because of my attachment to the Prophet O oh people, the tree wept out of being parted from him. Will we not weep and yearn to be with him? That is the crux. That is the, the question of the time. Who will you give the key to your heart to? If you don't give it to Allah, the Prophet وسلم, no one else is going to do that honor and that good for you. And we would have failed at some level in La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah And so if you hear the alim, the scholar, or the talib in the student of knowledge, or the mufti, talking about some things which to you may seem trivial, the beard, the trousers, the this, the walking in the masjid with the right foot, the going into the toilet with the left, these things, and you think it trivial, then maybe it's the way he's saying it, but it's likely that you, we have misunderstood that the sunnah is the path, the only path to nobility. The sunnah is the only path to nobility. And the more we are away from the sunnah, the more we are away from kamaliya, perfection. The more we are away from perfection. And the more we are away from our Adamic potential. But when the heart yearns and loves and venerates and celebrates and honors and respects that qalb of that bashar, becomes the greatest thing in the sight of Allah in the whole of this cosmos and not even the great angel Gabriel could rival such a qalb and the angels knew that as soon as Allah breathed rule into Adam taught Adam their names and they had to make sajda man became the qibla for the angels momentarily from a command of God because of the <coughs> 
and our honor is re attached to the sunnah and, uh, and, the, uh, and the, the sunnah and the seerah of the Prophet So there's a lot of work to be done. We ask Allah that he helps us roll up our sleeves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us uh, desirous of giving the key to the Prophet so that our hearts are in love with him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives into our hearts veneration and love of his most beloved, his Habib. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make us live according to the, the book and the sunnah and make us die <coughs> according to the sunnah. Not the sunnah that makes Islam into a rule book, but the sunnah that gives walaka karamna bani adam. So don't make the sunnah into a rule book, into a legal issue, even though fiqh and legality is part of our deen. But understand, it gives you meaning. It rescues us. It ennobles us. And what more can we want from God who is generous? Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillah rabbil alamin.